I'm just a guy that wants to reduce his bills and energy use. I installed solar, some more solar and yet more solar, then a home battery. I've done at least a dozen other things to reduce mine and my home's energy use. Cutting my bills to less than a quarter what they were. This channel is about this journey. So we bought this house at the end of 2014 and knew we wanted solar PV and started getting some quotes in early 2015. The first quote was from a company called The Mark Group that specialised in solar PV, solar hot water as well as cavity wall and loft insulation. When I saw the guy turn up in a black Merc I knew whatever we paid a large proportion would be going on this guy's commission. Straight off he started with a sales pitch A4 folder full of printed slides about how it was good for the environment how much we could generate and how much we'd earn on the feed-in tariff scheme. In Europe, the ideal position for solar is facing due south, but looking on Google Maps I saw that our house was actually facing southwest, which is less than ideal, but does mean that we'd get good sun in the afternoon when people are home in the evening, but we'd still be getting good generation during the day as well, but not so good generation in the morning. So the main detail was how much we wanted to spend. We could get 2 kilowatts of panel for £5,000, 3 kilowatts for 6000 or 4 kilowatts for 7000 The guy knew quite a bit about solar, but I knew that he wasn't somebody who'd be doing the install himself. That whether I liked this guy or not, the people installing could be cowboys for all I knew. So we thanked him for his time and said goodbye. It was more sold on getting solar, but knew I needed more quotes, and I wanted to arrange it quickly before the feed-in tariff disappeared. At the time, the UK government scheme would pay you 14 pence per kilowatt hour for everything you generate, whether you use it or not. I googled local solar installers, and this found me a company called Going Green Renewables. Straight away, I could see he was offering to install four kilowatt systems for only five thousand pounds. I called and told him I had had the hard sell to open, knew I wanted solar, and can he come round? Jay, the owner of the company, was an electrician who had got into solar many years ago. Importantly for me, he was the installer, not a salesman. Mark Group, I think I recall, were offering LG Neon 285-watt panels instead of the usual 250-watt panels. And Jay said he would check the prices but thought he could match them. So I'd be getting 14 285-watt panels for a total of 3,990 watts. Of course I got a call from the Mark Group a week later, but I said we'd had another quote for £5,000. Instantly they offered to match it. I talked it over with my girlfriend and we both agreed we preferred J. I for the 14p feed-in tariff. We had to get an EPC energy performance certificate to check how well insulated the house was. If we didn't get a score of C or above, the feed-in tariff would be only 6p, not 14p. This would mean the payback period would be 15 years, not 6 to 7. Jay had popped into the loft and seen we had a trust rafter system and sent off measurements to some guy who ran some calculations to confirm our roof was strong enough. It seemed to tick the box exercise as our house was only 35 years old. Maybe a more serious issue in a 100 year old property. There was a question where to locate the inverter. We decided on the house's built in garage. Many people choose to have the inverter fitted in the loft, but in my opinion that's a very, very stupid decision. Mainly, lofts get very hot in the summer and that's bad for electronics. At the time they said the inverter might fail after five to seven years, and to plan for this in your budget. Our original one is seven years old and working fine, touch wood. We fixed an install date a few weeks later and Jay turned up with a labourer and the scaffolding. I think at the time Jay just rented scaffolding by the day. Anyway, he and the labourer had the first section built in under an hour. I think I had told Jay I wanted to do a loft conversion one day, so the only decision on the day was where to put the panels. The southwest facing roof was big enough that we could be fairly flexible on this. Jay tried to convince me that putting them on the top of the roof would be better because the nearby trees would cause shading issues in the winter months. But I do recall him saying it wasn't ever so important as 90% of what you generate will be in spring to autumn and then it won't be an issue. Anyway, I wanted to leave my loft options open, so I said to fit them as low as possible on the main roof and up the right hand side which covers a smaller second loft. Maybe it wasn't the wisest move as the panels do suffer from shading four months of the year, but having added more powerful panels since, it's probably best that 
these inferior 285 watt panels are now on the shadier section. The first task after scaffolding is to lift the tiles, find the rafters, those are the timbers that run from the gutter to the ridge, and screw these large steel brackets to the rafters. The tiles are then slid back down over the bracket, hiding the join and keeping the roof waterproof. So the tiles fit flush, the tiles often need chamfering slightly. Finally, the aluminium rails are bolted to the top part of the bracket. Meanwhile, the girlfriend kept our daughters inside the house. Back outside, the scaffolders had finished installing the first eight panels on the right-hand side of the roof, and were moving the scaffolding over, ready for the next section, including the bridge over the conservatory. Here you can see the tiles being lifted in order to fit the brackets. Each rail has a bracket every one and a half meters or so, so a lot of tiles have to be lifted and trimmed. Jay hadn't made any mistakes in his calculations, and five rows of panels were a good fit across the whole width of the roof. As you can see, I could have got many more panels on the roof. A good four rows of five panels for a total of 20 panels, and maybe another three above those. As you can see, they bridged the conservatory quite efficiently with the scaffolding and nothing got dropped or broken. Electronically the panels are quite simple. All panels are quite similar really. They have a black junction box and two wires coming out so as to be connected to more panels and then back to the inverter. Each group is called a string. Before dismantling the scaffolding and before the sun sets, the last job was to test the voltage from each string. With 14 panels, the setup involved two strings of seven panels in series. The amount of sunlight affects the amps with about 9 to 10 amps per panel in full sunlight. And that was that. They took down the scaffolding and headed home. All panels fitted in a day. I like the black panels. They look a lot better than the cheaper, less efficient, blue-celled ones called polycrystalline. The black frame helps them blend into the roof quite well too, I think. Okay, Tesla sells solar tiles and they look neater, but that's something that's still not even sold outside of the USA yet. And the price for them is far more expensive than individual solar panels. These concrete tiles on my roof are 40 years old and should last another 40 years, at least. So do they really need replacing? From a narrow angle the panels can appear bluer and greyer depending on the sky, but as you can see from further away they look a lot blacker. Jay returned the next morning to do the inside stuff. This consisted of a Samuel Power 3680 watt two string inverter. The inverter itself has an emergency shut off isolator on the left but each string has an isolator, the black dials, and the whole lot has an isolator, the red dial. Beside the isolator is the generation meter. This is what you take the reading from to give to the company in charge of administering the feed-in tariff. So the inverter turns the DC electricity into AC electricity. One extra Jay taught me into getting was this clever black box, the Solic 200, a solar immersion heater controller. I think it was an extra £300 on top of the 5000 He explained that irrespective of any government feed-in tariff, for most of the year, the panels will be generating so much that it will be going back to the grid without us using it. This device will analyse what I'm using, prioritise the house, but send anything else to the immersion element in our hot water tank. At the end of the day, you'll have free hot water. And for that £300, it gives me free hot water for maybe eight to nine months of the year. With typical household bills heading to £2,000 a year on average, I think this must be easily saving me £300 a year now. So don't even think about not getting one if you get solar. These devices go by other names from other companies. There's the iBoost and also the popular MyEddy. This is the immersion switch outside the airing cupboard. And so now, for about eight months of the year, we just leave it permanently on. As per normal, the immersion will turn off when the tank reaches the right temperature. Interestingly, the light on the immersion switch outside the airing cupboard changes brightness depending on how much electricity is being sent into the immersion element in the tank. Also, if your gas supply failed, you can still press a button on the Solic 200 to override the solar and send 3 kilowatt to the immersion as per normal. Anyway, that covers the initial installation of my PV system. I'll do a separate video about the Solic 200 in more detail another time. Comment below if you have any thoughts or questions. And please subscribe, I'll be adding more videos in the near future. Thank you. Bye.